This program is sponsored in part by the Elizabethtown College Summer Scholarship, Creative Arts, and Research Projects. Elizabethtown College. Educate for service. Fantastic. What a feat for Galileo to realize that everything falls at the same rate. But for Einstein, it was a still greater act of imagination to realize that the reason those things all move the same, they get their moving orders from the same piece of space. It's not the distant Earth, it's the space right where they are. Yeah, there came to me the happiest thought of my life. Consider someone in free fall, for example, from the roof of a house. There exists for him during his fall no gravitational field. This thought led Einstein to create a theory of gravity called general relativity, whereby gravity isn't a force, as in Newtonian gravity. Instead, gravity is represented by curved spacetime. And the world lines, as I introduced in episodes two and three, for objects in free fall are geodesics in the curved spacetime. A geodesic is a path of extremal length, like the equator or any line of longitude on the globe. So let's look at the geodesics on a sphere. Any geodesic on a sphere is going to be a circle whose center is also the center of the sphere, called a great circle. Parallel of latitude up here, you see, for example, has a center located up here, not down here. And so it's not a great circle and it's not a geodesic. The path connecting A and B here along the great circle, in this case, the extremal length happens to be an absolute min in length. All the paths nearby are just a little bit longer. The path between A and B this way, along the great circle, is a path of relative maximum. In other words, paths around it here and here are just a little bit shorter. The mathematical object that contains the geometry for this curved spacetime is the metric, which tells you how to make spatio-temporal measurements everywhere in spacetime. So if you have the metric, you can tell where objects in freefall will go. That is, you can find the geodesics. Now let me show you some of the mathematical formalism of general relativity, although you don't need to really understand any of this moving forward to understand the mysteries that I'm going to display for you, but just to give you a sense of the, the complexity and the structure that I'm talking about. The geometry of space-time is determined by what we call the metric. And here you can see in two-dimensional plane, flat space and Cartesian coordinates x and y, you have dx squared plus dy squared equal the infinitesimal length squared. It may look familiar, right? The Pythagorean theorem is exactly where it comes from. In matrix form, like this, you would say here's the coefficient to the dx squared term, here's a coefficient to dx dy, there aren't any dx dy terms, the coefficient to dy dx, and there aren't any, and here's a coefficient to the dy squared term. And then these would have your numbers g11, g12, etc., where the x coordinate is number one and the y coordinate is say, number two. And the sphere that I showed you before there, the two dimensional sphere radius r, it would look like this, and this would be the, the form that it looks like in a matrix. So the goal in general relativity is to find these matrix elements, thereby giving us the geometry of space time. To do that, we have to solve Einstein's equations, general relativity. This is your Newtonian gravitational constant, speed of light there. This is the stress energy tensor here. And then this is the Einstein tensor there. It looks like a relatively simple expression, but actually it represents tens of thousands of terms if you were to write it out in general for all of your G11s and G12s and there are derivatives, first and second order derivatives, in all four coordinates, x, y, z, and time. The reason is the, the structure that you have to obtain contains substructures that go on and on. So here, for example, you have your Christoffel symbol in terms of derivatives in the metric. 
and those are used to get your Riemann curvature tensor components, which are then used to get your Ricci tensor components, which are then used to get the scalar curvature that goes there. Scalar curvature, Ricci tensor to get your Einstein tensor. So in general, Einstein's equations are very complicated, nonlinear, containing thousands of terms in general. And that's therefore not the way they're ever solved. This one expression is really 10 nonlinear partial differential equations in the metric and its derivatives. It's written in a highly condensed form, so you don't see all the metric terms. Consequently, the solutions are obtained by making simplifying assumptions about the distribution of matter energy and assuming symmetrical space-time structures. As Weinberg shows in his book, Gravitation and Cosmology, general relativity follows from the principle of equivalence, that is, space-time is locally flat, meaning that special relativity applies locally in general relativity. And that means general relativity is also based on no preferred reference frame. So do Einstein's equations constitute an adynamical global constraint and will check all at once view? Well, the left-hand side contains the metric, which is what we need to find the geodesics, while the right-hand side is the stress-energy tensor, which describes the matter, energy, and momentum content of space-time. So to get the metric on the left-hand side of Einstein's equations, you need the stress-energy tensor on the right-hand side. But you can't input force, momentum, and energy for the stress-energy tensor unless you know how to make spatio-temporal measurements, that is, unless you have the metric. Thus, solutions of Einstein's equations are simply self-consistent sets of spatio-temporal measurement, force, momentum, and energy on the space-time manifold. So Einstein's equations of general relativity do indeed provide an adynamical global constraint for our all-at-once model of physical reality per Wilczek. In the next two episodes, we will see that this adynamical view of Einstein's equations dispels mysteries created by the dynamical ANSI view of general relativity. There are two important aspects of Einstein's equations that we need moving forward. First, the solution of Einstein's equations obtains over the entirety of space-time. That may seem obvious, but we'll need to keep that in mind. Second, these equations are divergence-free. Regarding the stress-energy tensor, that simply means energy and momentum are conserved locally in space-time. So again, the goal in solving Einstein's equations for general relativity is to find the space-time metric from the Einstein tensor on the left-hand side of the equations. And for that, we need the stress-energy tensor on the right-hand side. And the stress-energy tensor contains concepts like energy, momentum, pressure, which is your force per unit area. But you can't input force, momentum, and energy for the stress energy tensor unless you know how to make spatiotemporal measurements, that is, unless you already have the metric from the Einstein tensor on the left-hand side. Thus, Einstein's equations are self-consistent sets of spatiotemporal measurement, force, momentum, and energy on the entirety of the space-time manifold M. A key concept fact about these equations is that they're divergence-free. And what divergence-free means for the right-hand side in terms of the stress-energy tensor is very simple. It simply means that all the momentum or energy or matter that's flowing into some region of space, a function of time, either flows out of that region of space or it accumulates therein. It's a local conservation principle for momentum and energy. Again, don't worry about the mathematical formalism. The mysteries of general relativity I will show and resolve for you in the next two episodes, for example, the origin of the universe and the grandfather paradox, don't require anything but a conceptual understanding of the physics. If you're ready to head further down the rabbit hole, come with me beyond the dynamical universe.